Interested in learning all about immersive audio? Then this episode is for you. So let's get to it. You are listening to the How to Create VR podcast, weekly conversations with VR and AR professional creators, designers, and producers. Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR podcast, where I speak with professional creators, designers, developers, and producers who work on VR, AR, and MR projects. I'm Marcelo Lewin, an immersive content specialist focused on e-learning and training. I'm also the creator and the guy behind HowToCreateVR.com. My guest is Michael Wall, an award-winning filmmaker and author of 12 books on post-production. He is most well-known as one of the original designers of Apple's Emmy award-winning software Final Cut Pro. Today, Michael and I will be talking about 360-degree immersive spatial 3D audio. We'll cover why there are so many terms to describe it and the technology behind it all. But before we get started, I want to remind you to register at howtocreatevr.com. It's free and registration gives you access to all of our live events, tutorials, practice assets, podcast interviews, videos, and more. It's quick and easy. Just visit howtocreatevr.com and click on the register for free button. All right, Michael, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. It was a surprise when I read your bio that you were one of the original designers of Final Cut Pro. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it was a long journey and at this point, quite a long time ago. That's very, very cool. So, were you part of the Final Cut Pro 1.0, I guess, when they released it? Yeah, there was actually about a five-year development process before 1.0 shipped. And I was on it from the very beginning of that. It started off at a company called Macromedia, now absorbed into Adobe. And right. It was developed for, I think, about two and a half or three years at Macromedia. And then Apple bought our team. Basically, they bought the project from Macromedia and brought it into Apple. And there was a little bit of rethinking it at that point. And then there was another year or 18 months before 1.0 finally came out. And then I stayed on, I think, for about another year after 1.0 and then went on to do filmmaking and teaching and other things. Very, very cool. Yeah, I was a huge Final Cut Pro fan. Until Final Cut Pro 10 came out, but we're not going to get into that. It's a totally different podcast. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Anyway, so welcome to the podcast. I'm glad to have you here. And why don't we start out? Well, you kind of gave us a little bit of your background that you did that, but why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into 360 video and specifically into immersive audio? You know, I've been fascinated by VR since 1990, actually. I attended an event called Cyberthon, which was this sort of trade show, sort of rave that happened in San Francisco at Colossal Studios. And there was an exhibit there where Jaron Lanier was showing off the original or one of the original prototypes for a VR system. And I got to try that there. And it was very primitive, but it was very promising. And, you know, like a lot of people at the time, I was just really smitten by the idea and was anxiously waiting to see how it was going to become a real product. And of course, it didn't. <laughs> and then 10 years later, it didn't again. And 10 years later, it didn't. Well, I guess about then is when it started, you know, when Oculus... Pum or Lucky. Yeah. Yeah, right. It sort of started bringing it back into the reality of what could be a product. And so, I've been sort of monitoring over the years. And mostly, I've been doing traditional filmmaking. And I've never been specifically exclusively an audio person, but I've done a lot of work with audio. And I certainly believe that audio is one of the most important aspects of any production. And I think when you get into immersive projects, that's even more true than ever. And so it's something that I'm very passionate about. Cool. Well, let's just jump in into audio itself. So why don't we start with figuring out what's the best format for VR? Well, I think it's actually a fairly complicated question because it depends a lot on your intended audience. If you're creating content that you expect most people are going to be viewing in a magic window on a phone without headphones or even on a computer screen without headphones, then there's not a whole lot of worth of developing spatialized or positional sound. However, if you are expecting your audience to be using headphones, then it's absolutely essential to have sound that is going to be positioned 
compositional and is going to be a lot to the objects in the scene. And so that format, in terms of specifically the types of format, we're mainly talking about ambisonic, B format ambisonic audio, and then there are a couple of subtypes in there, and we can get into some of the details of that in a little bit. The difference between whether or not you go for a spatialized sound mix or not has a lot to do with that intention of where your audience is going to see it. Well, let's talk about ambisonic and maybe explain what is ambisonic, when do you use it, and then the different kinds or types. Sure. There's a lot of different terms that are used to talk about audio that is coming from multiple places in the room or seems to be. And from basic surround sound, which is something that probably everyone is well familiar with and has been around and popular for a very long time, except surround sound, the speakers are fixed in place and presumably the viewer is fixed in place. And there's no expectation that the viewer can move their body or turn their head and expect sounds to come from different places. When we get into using headphones and watching stuff where you can turn your head and actually even move your body, we expect the sound to be moving along with us and for the sound to be positionally locked to the source of the sound in the scene. The way we do that is with generally this idea of spatialized sound or positional sound. And those two terms are not literally synonymous, uh, different contexts they're used differently, but they kind of imply the same thing, which is to say sound that is designed to appear as if it is coming from multiple places in the room. And as you move your head, if you're using a head tracking device, the sound will basically move in contrast to where you are. So effectively, if there's a dog barking to your left and you turn your head to the left, the dog barking will now be coming from directly in front of you. And so the sound is locked to the scene, not to the specific position of the listener or the specific position of the speakers or the headphones. And then ambisonic is a little bit more specific. This is a term for a specific way of both recording and exhibiting these spatialized sounds. And ambisonic has multiple orders. First order ambisonic has four channels. Second order has nine channels. Third order has, I actually don't remember exactly how many third order has, 18 or maybe it's 27. It's an exponential graph. So, But each order adds another axis of dimension along which the sound can be placed. And so it becomes more precise. And for recording, there are four channel ambisonic microphones. And there are a lot of different versions of that available. We could talk about that. And then there are even some second order microphones that have nine channels uh, literally nine sensors and so on. And then there are a number of other types of recording devices. For output, all of the sound is output and converted into a binaural mix, which is to say it is outputted into a two-channel mix so that you can listen to it in headphones. But the mix is very carefully designed so that the position of the sound simulates the real three-dimensional environment that you're in. But when you're recording ambisonic, right, the position of the mic is stuck, basically, in wherever you put it. So usually it's going to be underneath the camera. That means that you can't really move it. Let's say, for example, six degrees of freedom versus three degrees of freedom. Yeah. So if you're using an ambisonic microphone, the microphone is effectively going to be in a fixed position. Now, you can move the microphone. And if you were doing a moving camera shot, for example, you would have your microphone positioned alongside your camera. And so as the camera moved, the microphone would move. But if the camera is static, then the microphone is static. And so that limits the ability of a viewer to hear the sound if they are in a six degrees of freedom sort of environment, the sound is not going to be moving along with them. And so you need to modify that source input so that it can be represented with full spatial movement. It gets pretty complicated, but I want to set up one very important differentiation, which is the difference between whether you're working with 360 video or whether you're working with true VR. Because of course, 360 video is a subset of VR, but it does not have all of the freedom that true VR has. And so if you're working in 360 video, video, your visual images are not going to have six degrees of freedom either. And so the fact that the audio doesn't have six degrees of freedom is fine. The picture and the audio give the same experience. And as you turn your head, the sound moves accordingly and the picture moves accordingly. 
but you're not working with, you can't lean or you can't walk across the room. If you're working with true VR, like a room-based system where you can get up and move around or even stand up or sit down, you know, you need audio that's going to be able to move along with you. And there are tools, well, at least in Unity and in Unreal Engine, there are tools to create full six degrees of freedom sound, which builds in all sorts of mechanisms so that that works properly. But you're generally going to be doing that with mono sources, not with ambisonic sources. And this gets into a whole nother category of complication, right? Which is that even though we have microphones that can record ambisonically, they can record this 360s sphere of sound, that's not really ideal for many recording situations. And part of the reason for that is, as many listeners probably know, one of the most important attributes of your microphone is where it is placed. A microphone placed close to the subject of the sound is always going to give you better sound than a microphone that's quite far away. And because an ambisonic microphone is pretty much by definition going to be locked to the position of where the camera is, that means that it's limited to how close it's going to be able to get to your subject. And in 360 video, this is especially true because, of course, if your objects are too close to the camera, it's going to feel very uncomfortable to the viewer. And so many of the subjects of a 360 video are not a foot or two away from the source camera, and therefore the sound is not going to be that perfect. So we can't use boom mics because you would see that in the shot, right? You can't hide, you can't frame out a boom in a 360 video. So we wind up doing a lot of lavaliers and plant mics. And these are mono mics that are either attached to a subject, attached to a person, or positioned somewhere hidden in a room or hidden in a place where they can record a sound, you know, if someone's going to be over there or if there's a sound effect happening from a machine or whatever. And then all of those mono signals are brought into a 360 aware or an ambisonic aware sound mixing environment, and they are positioned that way. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So the big difference between six degrees of freedom and three degrees of freedom for those users that aren't familiar is three degrees of freedom, right? It's head position, where six degrees of freedom is head position plus body positioning. So you can actually move forward, backwards, right and left. So that means that if you're following audio, the audio has to follow you. And that's a true VR experience, right? Usually using Unity and CG computer generated environments. And not just it's the position, but also remember things like occlusion. Like if you move behind an object, if the sound needs to be appropriately dampened, you've moved into a place where the sound is now being obscured. The representation of that sound needs to represent that. Right. That totally makes sense. So going back to ambisonics recording and maybe saying that basically it's a worthless kind of thing that you'll never use, it's probably too harsh. But when do you then use an ambisonic microphone? Well, an ambisonic mic is great for a true surround sound ambience. It's going to be a really useful component in your final mix. And so I do recommend using an ambisonic microphone, but it's rarely going to be the only microphone you're going to use. And so there are a number of options for microphones. And mostly what we use are what we call tetrahedral, which means four heads. And a tetrahedral mic is the first order ambisonic microphone. And Sennheiser has one and Core Mic has one and Zoom actually actually has a new one that I haven't gotten to use yet, but is very promising. Rode has one, and they actually bought a company called Soundfield, which was one of the original ambisonic microphone makers. So there are a lot of options for recording ambisonic sounds. And in fact, even some 360 cameras have built in ambisonic recording. And all of this is useful as sort of a baseline, as sort of a background track that will give you positional sound from the position of the microphone. But but it's not going to be complete unless what you're recording is like a natural environment. You know, if you're like out in the woods and you just want to hear the sound of the frogs chirping and the various other elements. Although even then, I personally would probably be inclined to re-record some of those elements and position them more deliberately so that you can control the level. So really then for Ambisonic, you're mainly going to be using it for 360 video versus a full virtual reality experience that allows you to move around. That's right. Now, there are some new mics. There's a company called Xylia, Z-Y-L-I-A. And I honestly haven't gotten to play with their product yet, but they've got a very interesting microphone. I think it has 18 heads or 18 recording elements. And it is 
is designed to create sound that can then be used in a six degrees of freedom environment. They work with software from a company called Infineon. Between Xylia and Infineon, they are offering this solution for recording live sound that can then supposedly be reproduced in an environment where you have that six degrees of freedom. But I honestly don't know much about how it works and I haven't gotten to try it myself, but it's a promising development. I see. Maybe it actually separates everything and then it becomes key frameable or or whatever within the scene, I guess, maybe. Right. Well, and that's, of course, what you would do with a mono track, right, is you can keyframe its position and you can lock it to a subject in the frame. And yeah, maybe it somehow divides up the audio so that you can then work with a 360 mixing environment to make it more flexible. So going back to Ambisonic, audio that's live recorded, how do you monitor? Because normally when you're shooting flat traditional video and audio, you know, you're always monitoring the audio to make sure. How do you monitor Ambisonic? audio live? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's tricky. I think that some of the microphones will also output a stereo or a binaural mix directly. Like in fact, the new Zoom, I think it's called the H3 VR. That's a new mic from Zoom. That's cheap. It's like 200 bucks. And it's recording ambisonic tetrahedral, I believe. And it has a output that will give you a live monitoring. I assume it's just a stereo monitoring, although it may actually be a binaural monitoring system so that if you're listening through headphones, you can hear exactly what the mic is hearing. But the more traditional mics are recording into, I don't want to get too technical, but they record basically into what's called A format, which is basically just the four mics being recorded into individual channels. And so the microphone literally has four XLR outputs. You record those into an audio recording device and there's no way to monitor that. So you might monitor one of the channels so that you can hear something or you might have a simultaneously another microphone that's recording a mono signal or the camera mic and you're just listening to that as a scratch track. But there's not a way to on the fly hear that A format audio live in the ambisonic format. And so just to further that process, a couple little details, a little tip for that is when you're recording with an ambisonic mic, you want to make sure that you're using an audio recorder that has digital level settings not analog level settings. And that's because the levels of the four channels have to be exactly the same. Even the smallest variation will distort the sphere that you're recording when it's translated. So it's very important to use a recording device that has digital levels so that you can be sure that all four levels are being exactly the same. And then there is a process by which you transfer the A format, which again is just four mono channels, into what's called B format. And B format is basically an XYZ positional plus volume or level. So you basically have still four channels, but the four channels represent the X axis, the Y axis, the Z axis. I believe it's a level, like a volume that maybe simulates distance, I guess. And so that B format audio is what is then basically if you embed that B format audio into the game engine or even into a QuickTime video or a video on YouTube or MP4 for the playback engine, be it YouTube or Facebook or whatever game engine you're using to play back, will automatically be able to assign that B format data into the spatialized sound so that when you turn your head in your headphones, it moves appropriately. Now, how do you hide the cable, right? Because in traditional media, you can monitor live throughout the recording because you're behind the camera, but in 360, you can't. So what do you do? Is there like some sort of Bluetooth connection? that you can put in between the mic, the headphone set and the plug? Or do you just monitor at the beginning and then unplug and hope that everything works? Well, that's a great question. Of course, it's the same problem we have with monitoring our video, right? You either need a wireless video feed, and in this case, a wireless audio feed, or you're going to have a cable that you're going to need to effectively paint out. Right. But a lot of the cameras nowadays, through their apps, you can actually monitor the video. And they generally will also output audio. And so you may not be getting the ambisonic audio, but you're getting an audio signal that you can use for monitoring. And, you know, generally, my experience is that 
in production, it's not so critical to be monitoring the audio in true ambisonic. It doesn't need to be positional for me to be able to determine whether the levels are right and whether the content is working. I just need to hear a clear audio signal. Yeah, yeah. I meant not monitoring like if it's positionally correct because it's going to be positionally correct because the mic is there. But how do you actually just monitor it to make sure that the mics just didn't fail? I think the answer is either you're using a wireless transmitter of some sort or you have a cable that you're painting out or it's just well hidden in the set. And there's a lot of techniques for this in terms of video where either shooting in quadrants, right, where you basically shoot part of the scene so that the crew can be standing behind the camera and then you rotate the camera and shoot the back or the VR 180 format, which is becoming, I think, increasingly popular, you know, alleviates that issue. But, you know, if you're using wireless mics, like you're using the wireless lavalier that's mounted on somebody's lavalier on their lapel, that sound is wireless anyway. And so that can be transmitted to, to like a the mixer. Res- yeah. Or, yeah, to the mixer, which is in the location where the director or the sound mixer is listening. That makes sense. Yeah, I was mainly, I guess the question was for the ambisonic audio because that usually is right by the camera. So Yeah, and I mean, I think the answer is there's not a good answer. I think most of the time what you'd probably do is what you suggested, which is you might check it at the beginning, check it at the end, do occasional playback tests to make sure that there's no failure. So we talked about production and using both ambisonic to capture the ambience, maybe even for sync sound, I guess, if it's not that great. And then mono mics, basically like labs to capture everything else or hidden mics throughout to capture the rest. So when you bring in all these audio files, what tools do you edit your mix in? Because I know Premiere Pro doesn't support, right? The spatialized audio, the, the placement of the actual audio and keyframing it. Yeah, you're going to need to use a 360 or a 3D sound panner, basically, which is like a surround panner that is 360 aware or that is aware of ambassador. Sonic. And there are a variety of plugins from many of the major manufacturers. I mean, Waves has a popular one. There's one called AmbiPan and Blue Ripple Sound. Blue Ripple is actually one of the longtime leaders in working with Ambisonic long before VR. And they've got a series of plugins both for encoding and for mixing and for decoding. And these plugins are general format. They'll work in Pro Tools or Reaper or Nuendo or Logic or even Adobe Audition if you're in the Adobe suite, you know, Audacity. They're plugins that will work pretty much in any software. And what they give you is a graphical interface. Usually what it is, is it's a a lat long, like an equirectangular image of your video that you can then basically add a point, a visual point for the source of a sound. And so let's say you've got a mono sound from somebody's microphone, from an actor. You can basically just identify the actor in the equirectangular image and basically add a point to the image that is where that source is. And then the panning will basically be locked so that the source will always come from that spot. And if that actor is walking around, you would simply keyframe it. So you just go forward a little bit in time and then add another indicator for now the sound is moved over to here and the software will automatically interpolate the difference in between. And then all that data is basically stored into the ambisonic file that you're outputting. So you do that for all your mics. Exactly. You do that for each of your mics. And then if you have an ambisonic source, you can also incorporate that into the mix. And there are a couple of things that you can do with that ambisonic source. One of the most important things is that you can rotate it. You can rotate it just like the way you rotate 360 video. You know, so if you're shooting 360 video, you may decide to adjust where the center point is, where north is. And so you need to make sure that the ambisonic microphone is corresponding to that and is being rotated accordingly. And so one of the another little tip for if you're recording with ambisonic mics, it's essential to record to note which is the front, where is the front of the mic, and whether it's upside down or right side up, or in some cases sideways. And all of the ambisonic mics have a little indicator, a little logo or something to help you know where the front of the mic is. And that becomes essential because let's say you rotate your visuals by 16 degrees to the left, you need to make sure that you correspondingly rotate your audio too. And I believe like the H3 VR, which I bought and haven't used yet because I wanted to actually understand the whole workflow as well, but I believe they have a switch so you can tell it if you're upside down, right side up or sideways. And then that adds metadata to the file, I presume, or something. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's essential. I mean, it's the sort of thing that it's, you know, you can be off by maybe a couple degrees and get away with it. But if you move even 
than 10 or 12 degrees, everything's going to sound a little bit off. Like where you're looking, everything's going to seem a little bit, it's a sort of like out of sync feeling. And so be making sure that your sound is properly aligned with the, this is specifically for ambisonic recordings, right? So if you have an ambisonic recording that you're mixing into your final mix, you need to make sure that it is properly rotated. And then there's also something called dominance, which is to say to basically to effectively cheat the microphone towards one of the vectors, towards X, Y, or Z in either direction. And so the mixing software will allow you to adjust that dominance. And I don't know exactly when you would do that, but basically what you're doing is cheating the position of the microphone in post effectively. But there's not much more you can do to that ambisonic recording. I mean, you can EQ it, but you can't add any reverb. Reverb will completely destroy the ambisonic recording because, of course, part of the ambisonic recording is capturing all of the bouncing off of the various walls and creating a natural sounding environment. And so with higher order ambisonics, with second order or third order, where you have a lot more channels, there are more options. And I honestly, again, I haven't done a lot of work with that stuff, but I know that if you're working in that higher system, you have a little bit more flexibility with what you can do to simulate or to modify the sound or change the scope of the room or, you know, some sort of more broader effects that you could apply to that ambisonic recording. So let's talk about occlusion. How do we simulate occlusion? So let's pretend on the left side of a room, there's a radio and a person walks in front of the radio. How do you simulate occlusion if you're just having a mono sound coming out of the radio, right, that you positioned it in post-production? But when that person comes in, how do you simulate that occlusion? Well, the truth is that this is all handled really through plugins in the game engine. And Unreal Engine, I believe it is built in. And for Unity, I think there's a plugin, although maybe in the most recent versions, that's also built in. And so there are plugins, there are controls in the game engine if it knows where the source of the audio is and there is another object in the way, it will automatically apply that occlusion. And you can control how much, basically there's two factors. You can attenuate the sound, you can lower the level of the sound, and you can effectively apply like a low pass to sort of muffle the sound a little bit. And so there are sliders in both of those programs for controlling how much effectively how much occlusion you get. Again, this is something that I have been the client and watched my sound mixer do, but I haven't actually operated this myself. So I have limited knowledge of all of the parameters, but that's basically the way it works. And it's fairly simple. The game engine is taking care of all the work for you. And then this is handled also in the playback engine. So for example, you know, in the Facebook player and Facebook's been a real leader in this, that they bought a company called Two Big Ears a number of years ago and Two Big Ears was one of the leading ambisonic audio output software manufacturers. And basically, Facebook bought their system and released it for free as something called the Facebook 360 audio tool, right? Actually, the spatial workstation. It's called the Facebook 360 spatial workstation. And this is a free set of plugins and also some standalone software tools that are very, very widely used. They're not very complicated. They're very simple, but they include 360 mixers. They include ways of muxing your audio and your video, which I presume we'll get to in a minute. And when you're playing back the audio in like, for example, the Facebook player, even if you're looking at a magic window on a computer screen and you're rotating the image, again, this is more for 360 video than true VR, but the sound will automatically adjust. So if there is a sound, let's say, coming from due east and you're looking straight north and then that sound will be coming out of the right speaker. And then if you were to pan the video over in the magic window, that sound will naturally move. And then if you were to pan the other direction so that it's basically behind you or completely out of the view, that sound will basically be attenuated in a similar effect of the occlusion, basically, right? So it's like out of sight, out of mind. Like when it's out of the view by a certain degree, the sound will basically be removed. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned muxing. So let's get to that portion, which is where that's basically you're done with the mix and now you're going to bring it in and mix it with your video and anything else, right? Can you explain that workflow? 
So it's not complicated, but it requires special software, basically. And all you're doing is you are unifying your audio file and your video file into a single file without modifying the individual components. And so, for example, like if you were to use Apple's compressor to take a spatialized audio track and combine it with a 360 video track, I'm not sure if they fixed this, but I don't think they have, you'll lose your spatialized sound. It will just turn into a stereo track. And so you need to be sure you're using tools that will not modify the audio. And there is a special tool in that 360, in that spatial workstation from Facebook, also Google's VR180 tools. I think it's called VR180 Creator. It's a very, very simplistic piece of software that allows you to take VR180 picture and edit it. Basically, for the picture side, what it does is it maps the VR180 into a 360 sphere so that you can use it in a software like Premiere. And that software also includes a muxing tool. And it doesn't matter whether it's VR180 or just True360, you can load up. And basically, it's just a simple file dialog. You pick your audio file, you pick your video file, and they are combined into a single file. But the other piece is that you have to add metadata to tell the playback engine that it has spatialized sound and also what format that spatialized sound is in. So in some cases, this is a separate step. So basically, the muxing is combining the audio and video, and then there's also the step of adding the metadata. And again, anybody who's worked with 360 video already probably is well familiar with this because you have to also include metadata to tell the playback engine that the video is 360. Well, similarly, you have to tell it that it is spatialized. But then there's this one additional element, which is that there are multiple basically different file formats for storing spatialized sound, ambisonic sound. The one that's mostly being used right now is Ambix. It's basically using the SN3D sound format, which is a way of storing the ambisonic data, and it saves it in Apple's core audio format, which is a linear PCM format. So it's an uncompressed format. And that is called Ambix, A-M-B-I-X. And that is what Google has basically adopted. And because Google has adopted it and they are so active in promoting the use of this stuff. It's becoming a dominant standard, but it's not exclusive. There is also Dolby Atmos. Dolby is doing their best to keep the Dolby Atmos format as a way of exhibiting or distributing positional audio. And then there's something called FUMA, F-U-M-A, which is first Malham. There's two people. And that is basically a different way of storing the ambisonic data in a wave file. And that's usually has the extension of AMB, like ambisonic. So FUMA, Ambix, Dolby Atmos. There's also something called OpenAL, which is an open source format that contains the ambisonic data. And so all of these different formats are ways of storing your audio. And for different playback engines, first of all, some playback engines only support some of these. So if you're trying to play it on YouTube, you pretty much have to use that Ambix. But if you're building it in a game engine, you have a lot more options. If you're building your own app, you have a lot more options. But you need to make sure that your playback engine basically knows what format this audio is saved in. That makes a lot of sense on that. This is very complicated stuff. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed by all of these different formats and all these different names. But really, the basics of it are fairly straightforward. It's simply picking a lane and sticking with it. And effectively, if you know what your plan is for your output, but if you know where you're going to distribute it or how your product is going to be viewed, again, if you're using a particular game engine or if you're using you're building your own app or if you are using a 360 video and you're playing it back in different environments, as long as you know what your end result is, you kind of can just pick that lane and then forget about all the other details. Where I was kind of going towards is it's complicated in the sense that there doesn't seem to be a one standard, right, that the industry is moving towards. So it's a question and sort of a concern too is if you pick the lane and it seems like all these lanes are under construction if you pick the wrong lane are you running the risk of your experience not working later on when a new standard comes up or do you feel that there's really never going to be just one standard well i think that's a great question and i don't have the crystal ball to know what's going to happen in the future but i do think that all of this is still under development you know these ambisonic formats have actually been around for decades ambisonic audio precedes vr by a long time and so there were all sorts of scientific uses and other contexts where people were recording ambisonic audio and using these formats to represent it and distribute it. So to some extent, 
The difference is, I mean, Dolby and Google, are, I think, are doing their best to try to establish themselves as the standard. And Google's standard isn't their own. They picked this format that I don't know actually where Ambix came from, but they're endorsing that one. And I think both companies have a lot of muscle. I think Google probably has more muscle than Dolby, although Dolby's got a lot of respect in the industry. So I guess the answer is that you are going to get stuck if you pick a lane. If you do stuff, if you do everything, in Dolby Atmos, and then that format gets downgraded, or Dolby comes out with something that's not backward compatible, or Google takes over the world, and there's just not a way to exhibit it, you may be stuck. Although all of these formats are representing the same raw data. So there's no reason you can't output multiple mixes. So you can output an Ambix version, and then you could also output an Atmos version, and then you can also output a Fuma version, and have all of those in your master's so that if you have different distribution avenues that need different ones, you can use the different formats. Or as you're saying, if things change in the future, you could always go back to one of these alternate formats. That's true, because the key here is that these formats are not recording formats, they're delivery formats. That's correct. Right. So as long as you have your recording format cemented and it's always there, then your delivery can change a million times and you just re-export to the new format. Hopefully, right? Hopefully. Well, you know, I mean, in a perfect situation, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, here's the thing. If you've done all of your work in first order ambisonic, which is to say four channel ambisonic, and then eventually second order ambisonics become standard. And I hope that that becomes true because it's a lot more accurate. It's a lot more precise to have nine channels than four channels. And so if in a couple of years, all the playback engines are starting to support this second order ambisonics, your four channel ambisonics, you know, it's going to be compatible, but it's not going to have the level of precision. And so you might actually have to go back to your mix and effectively remix or re-output your sound into a second order ambisonics distribution file. Well, Michael, unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. I did want to ask you if you have any thoughts on AR and how positionally placed audio affects AR experiences. I think it's pretty much exactly as it is with VR. I think the trick is the monitoring environment, right? Because if you're talking about AR as opposed to MR, right, which is to say you're looking at images projected onto the real world and you presumably need to hear some sound from the natural environment in addition to the synthetic elements you're adding, the trick is going to be how are you going to monitor effectively, like you can't use a closed ear headphone sort of situation, right? Because you need to be able to hear the sounds of what's going on in the real world in addition to the AR elements. And that's a listening question. But for the AR elements themselves, the more you can include spatialized sound with them, the more naturalistic and real in the environment they're going to feel. If you're working in MR, which is to say that you're looking at a recorded version of the world in front of you with synthetic elements laid on top, I think it's easier to use a closed ear system effectively, right? Because all of the data you're looking at is controllable, right? There's not real elements that you have no control over. And so it seems like that might be a little bit more flexible. You can use it exactly the same as you do with VR. Well, Michael, you're a wealth of information. Thank you for sharing the knowledge with the community. I really appreciate that. I'm really happy to be able to. Now, if people want to get a hold of you, do you want to give them a URL or a Twitter or email, whatever you like? Well, 360videohandbook.com, the number 360, and then videohandbook.com is the source for my book on 360 video, which is basically just a hands-on guide from script creation to camera work and production to post-production and then to exhibition, and obviously includes a lot about audio as well as visuals. And there is a contact form on that site. And that's probably the easiest, best way to get in touch with me and to learn more about my work in VR. Great. Give that URL one more time. 360videohandbook.com. I think everybody should go get it. You know, one thing I can also offer is a little discount for your listeners. Go for it. I love that. So 25% discount on anything, which is basically is a PDF, an EPUB, or the printed version of the book. If you use the code how to create VR, that will give you a 25% discount. Discounts are always welcome. Thank you, Michael, for doing that. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And great talking to you, Marcelo. And great speaking with you too. And thank you all for being with us. Just a quick reminder, if you want to access all of our live events, tutorials, practice assets, 
edits, podcast interviews, videos, and more, register for free at howtocreatevr.com. Finally, if you want to attend our live events in virtual reality, join us inside Altspace VR. Just visit howtocreatevr.com forward slash Altspace VR and subscribe to our channel. So until the next episode, I'm Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.